integrity uh, as an excuse to not be disciplined in the things of God. But what you do is that we live in all that God has for us and everything that God has intended for us and everything that God is making. So we're going to wrap up the series today. We are in chapter 6 of the book of Galatians. This is going to be my last uh, talk in this book for this series. And then we have our Christmas and then we have our New Year's service, our Christmas and New Year's uh, weekend. And then we go into January. And when we were in worship this morning, I had this little flash from God. And that we are closing out a decade And we are going into a brand new decade in 2020. And I heard the voice of God tell me that you can have your best decade ever. If you will look to him for wisdom, guidance, direction. If you will call on his name and you will believe who he is and what he is going to do in your life. I just saw a little snapshot that God wants to do some big things in 2020, but the entire decade. It's time to bring people into the kingdom of God. It's time to get your friends saved that you've been praying for for a long time. It's time to see life change. And don't worry, don't worry about the government. We have a bigger government that watches over us. And that's the kingdom of God. And some of you are going to experience much closer relationship with God. I see the year 2020 as a foundation for the whole decade where it's going to be building on your personal relationship with God and being stronger and stronger and stronger. So you are going to have, you are going to have a good decade. And you're going to have a good 2020 or I'm going to slap you. So wake up. You're going to believe the word of God and walk in the presence of God. So let's, we're going to uh, close up the book of uh, Galatians today. And, and the little subtitle for today is The Law of Christ. I want to talk to you a little bit about the law of Christ. Christ has redeemed us from the law, but he's entered us into a new law. And most of you know the law. Jesus said, I, a new commandment, I leave you to love one another as you uh, love yourself, as you love God, to love God with all your heart and love one another. So the new commandment of the New Testament is to be kind to other people. So in in Galatians chapter 6, Paul begins wrapping up his letter. And as he wraps it up, it's kind of like a little spitfire. Boom, 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 boom. It's like some bullet points that he's making. He goes, I want to make this bullet point, this bullet point, this bullet point, and I'm closing by, they're taking away the parchment, you know, kind of thing. You know, it's like, okay, it's getting dark here. I'm in this little prison cell right now, and it's, you know, I'm going to wrap this up and got to get it going and get it to you. And so what's happening is he's wrapping up, and he gets a few major points that he wants to get across to everybody, and he wants you to get this inside your heart and say goodbye, do this. So we begin in Genesis, uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. It says this, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, You who are spiritual, uh, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So here's the Bible verse. Brethren, we're referring to the people of believers. Believers, your brethren, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, the family of God. If a man, and the word man is in reference to the group that he's referring to, a man or a woman, if a person is overtaken in any trespass, any trespass. And the word for the Greek word here for trespass has to do with sin. And some other translations actually translate it as sin. If he's overtaken or is involved in any sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Why? I'm not going to say that yet. I'm going to say the why in just a second. What I'm going to say to you is here, I want you to emphasize the word any. Any trespass, any sin. He, Paul is acknowledging that Christians can sin. Paul is saying, if you have someone that's among your fellowship, among your family, among your believers, among the people you relate with, among your church, if you see one overtaken in any sin, which means you have the capability of sinning, he says, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. 
restore. The word for restore is used by fishermen. It's a word that would be used that you had a rip net and you were going to mend the net and put it back together and make it usable to be reused again in the water. So if we're going to restore someone who has been hurt by sin, there are two ways people get hurt by sin. The sin could be upon them and they are the victim of someone else's sin. The other can be you have committed the sin and that you are now disengaged with where God has you on your journey and we're going to restore you back to focus. So it says here, if you are a mature Christian, if you are a mature Christian, I'll say it one more time. If you consider yourself one that is a believer and strong in your faith, when you see another believer sin, your first reaction should not be judgment, it should be restoration. It shouldn't be, oh man, I'm really disappointed in you. It should be, how can we restore you? Now, here's the but. It's a big but. No. And it, it really, it shouldn't even be a but. It should be, I want to say, but this. God would never put a command on you that he isn't already doing. This Bible verse reveals how the father looks at sin in a Christian. The father through the Apostle Paul and through the unction of the Holy Spirit who's moving Paul to write the letter would not tell the believers to look at another believer who has sinned in the spirit of gentleness to restore them unless the Father already does. The Father is not coming to you with condemnation and judgment and saying how horrible you are. Those thoughts that you have in your head about your sin come from the devil. The Father is saying... I need to mend you. I need to restore you. I need to fix you. And that's the grace of God. It is not, and somebody may say, well, you know, uh, then, then what difference does it make if you sin? What difference does it make is do you always want to be under repair or would you like to be involved? Would you like to be on the, on the DL list or on the starting squad? DL, do you know what that means? I'm, I'm, I mean, that's like a, or, it's not politically correct. Inj- oh. Injured, reserved. That's what they are now. Okay, let's, let's put it another way. Do you always want to be the patient in the hospital? Or do you want to be the strong spiritual person visiting the patient in the hospital? (laughs) Do you always want to be set aside and you can't play because you're hurt or you're involved in the game because you are in shape? Now, here's what most Christians do when they see another Christian sin. Oh my God, I couldn't believe that. Or, yeah, they're worse than me. You see that a lot. But here, the Bible is saying, if you, are a, if you see another person overtaken with any trespass, any sin, any sin, what's your, what's your pet peeve sin that you really despise and that you get mad when you hear about people participating in it? That's there. That's under any. Any sin. If you see a Christian do any sin... You who are spiritual, which means if your first reaction is judgment, maybe you're not spiritual. Did I say that? I thought I was only thinking that. But maybe it's time for all of us to grow up. And Paul is saying when you see your brother sin, don't boot him out, judge him, make and reject him, restore him. So, and it needs to be done in the spirit of gentleness. And then he says, you know, why? In verse 2, bear, he says, to do it in the spirit of gentleness, before I go there, in verse 2, it says, um, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And what Paul is saying here is, what happens when you fall? How would you like to be treated by other believers? 
How should you be treated by other Christians? If you, if you fall into a sin or if you commit a sin or you, you fall into a season of your life where you are stumbling and making wrong choices, do you want all the Christians to be bad on you and mad at you? Or do you want them to be restoring you? <clears throat> I'm thinking right now of What's come to my mind is Kanye West. And the reason it comes to my mind is he decided to come out and just, and I'm going to use my words, jam for Jesus. And I thought it's awesome. I am so behind anyone who wants to exalt Jesus, but yet his biggest obstacle that he's had have been other Christians. Other Christians who will judge him. Well, you're not good enough. You haven't, done, you haven't done this. You haven't done that. How do we know it's real? It's still Jesus being exalted. Jesus being lifted up. And if Jesus is being lifted up, shouldn't we all be happy about it? You know, but here's what happens is, is we start looking at people and we start making judgment, and we start criticizing, and we know nothing about their heart. We don't know what they're struggling with. We don't know what they're walking through. We don't know how the Holy Spirit has been using them and, and moving inside. To me, it's just like God, to take somebody who's got a lot of recognition and then say, speak my name. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I just think it's cool. <clears throat> Look at verse two. In verse two it says, Bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. These two verses are going together, and he says you're going to fulfill the law of Christ if you bear one another's burden. The word for burden here means that you have been overtaken. It's something that is, is bigger than you, something it has to do that has come upon you, and that this person cannot survive without other people helping. And it's reference to the sin in verse 1. So in verse 1 and verse 2, Paul talks about the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to love one another. Jesus said, a new commandment I leave with you. John the apostle, he repeated it multiple times. He says that we have a commandment, and the commandment is to love one another. And in other words, we're supposed to like each other. We're supposed to accept one another. And we're supposed to look at other people who are calling on the faith of Jesus Christ and help them in their journey of life. So Paul is wrapping up his letter, and he says, you know what? Before you get judgmental on other people's sin, would you make sure that you approach them in gentleness? Because one day you may need them to approach you. And you make sure that you fulfill the law of Christ, which simply means that you make sure that you're going to show the love of God and the love of things, and that God is going to work inside through you onto them. And then he says, uh, he says in verse 3, for if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. This is you who have judged the believer in their sin. This is you who is not willing to help another believer who has been, is having a moment or a journey or a, a detour of sin and needs to be restored. If you think yourself is something and, and you're really nothing, then you're deceiving yourself. In other words, when you look at somebody else and you judge them for their sin and you exalt yourself for your sinlessness, you're a nothing. You're making a mistake here. And he says in verse 3, For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. Now it says in verse 2 that you are supposed to help another person's burden, but you're supposed to bear your own load. And they are two separate Greek words. And there are two different meanings that Paul is trying to communicate. He says that when you see someone who is overtaken in a trespass, when you see someone who's not being able to, to swim by themselves and they need a life preserver or they need someone to jump in the water and grab them and pull them to the shore, if you see someone drowning in their sin, don't judge them, restore them. 
At the same time, you're supposed to examine your own work and bear your own load. And what it refers to here is bearing your own load is referring to what have you been called to do? What has God asked you to do in your life? Are you doing it? We are currently coming out of a decade of pure, self-centered Christianity. We are going into a new decade that I pray will be one of service. We are coming out of a decade where most Christians think of themselves only and do not think of other people. And they run their life what's convenient and comfortable for them and not what is going to build the kingdom. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Suzette and I know this couple, and um, they're a very successful couple, have a very successful business. Husband and wife does the business together, and they are CEO Christians, Christmas and Easter only. <laughs> and they would come to Christmas, and they'd come to Easter, and I remember talking to them, and they made this statement. If we weren't so busy, we would go to church right here. We love the church. But we're too busy. And they had just joined a country club so they can play golf on Saturday and Sunday, take multiple weekend trips, and living for themselves. Enjoying their prosperity, enjoying their life, uh, making sure that they are well taken care of, but they're not sowing any eternal life or results into other people's lives. They are only thinking of what makes them comfortable. And when it comes to sacrificial living, the American Christian over the last decade has lost sight of it. We, I, I'm talking to the choir, we the choir need to sing the song, Wake Up America, and get back into serving Jesus Christ. One day, life is going to be over, and your eternal life is going to be based off of your service into this life. And what we have to do is make sure that we don't do everything that just is comfortable for us and our little family and that we're not involved in the kingdom of God. And Paul is trying to communicate, you need to bear your own load. You need to bear your own load. In other words, God looks at every single Christian, every one of them, and asks them to be involved in life. Ask them to be involved in a local church. Ask them to be involved in missions. Ask them to be aware of what's going on in the world and take Christ to the world. And we do that in our different occupations, but we wear Christ and we live for him. And in our occupations, we hold our, we pray for people around us, we are planted by God, and we communicate as the Holy Spirit opens the door, the love of Jesus Christ. At the same time, when we see other believers who commit a sin or fall into some trespass, we restore to spirit in a spirit of gentleness. If I went back to that and I went and I had this, the first verse on the screen and it said any trespass. Did you know adultery is a trespass? Did you know that stealing is a trespass is a sin? Wrath, anger, out of control temper, those are sins. The Bible says that we're supposed to, as spiritual believers, restore those people in the spirit of gentleness, not bring judgment to them. So what we have to make sure that we do is that we don't take the people who are, what's the, 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 the new list now? Injured, reserved, and kick them off the team. Let's get them restored. Let's give them the first aid that they need. Let's give them the assistance that, that, that they need that gets them back into life, that they're able to do what God has asked them to do. And he says again in verse four, but let each one examine his own work 
And then we will have rejoicing, then he'll have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. You have been called by God to bear your own load. You have been called by God to do something in the kingdom. And that you need to do that and be involved in that. And then you'll have rejoicing. And again, there's bullet points. So he, he, in the first bullet point, he takes the first two verses and he says, here's how you should treat those who fall in sin who are among you and walk in the love or the law of Christ. And then he takes the next couple of verses and he talks about judging yourself instead of judging others and make sure you carry your own load before you start pointing your finger at someone else not doing their job. And then he gets into another bullet point and he says, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. And here's what Paul says, pay the preacher. Pay the preacher. That's what he says. Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians, he said, 1 Corinthians 9 11, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? Paul was saying, why are you upset that preachers are going to be paid? Think about this. <clears throat> a baseball player, uh, I think for, I think Anaheim, who did they just sign for $252 million seven-year contract? Is that right? 245. 245. Right, right in there. 243.4. <laughs> Seven years, five days. <laughs> yeah, but we're not being specific. But right in there. Okay, $240 million to play baseball for seven years. Yay, good for you. If a preacher made $245 million in seven years, they'd be screaming scandal. Of course. Don't you think Billy Graham was worth $245 million? I'm sorry, I don't, you know, everybody has their different opinion, but when I see how many people Joel Osteen is touching worldwide, I think he's worth $245 million for a seven-year contract. Here's what I'm saying is, when the seven years are over and the $245 million are gone and it's in someone else's bank account and his, his term is done, maybe, you know, God forbid that he gets injured, but let's just say he decides to retire in seven years, he's over with, he's a memory now. That memory and those games that he played probably did not get one person to heaven. But you take someone like a Billy Graham or a Joel Osteen or someone else who has um, worldwide influence and they have gotten thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people into heaven for eternity. What value do we put on it? But yet we get mad if a preacher has a decent salary. Because we are being led by a secular mindset instead of a kingdom of God mindset. And as soon as the preacher has anything good, we assume, we assume scandal. And we assume rip-off. And we assume that he is just taking you for your money. But yet God says, pay them. Yeah. I feel like Congress asking for a raise. <laughs> I'm not asking for a raise. But I think I'm worth more than a baseball player. Because <laughs> entertainment lasts for a moment. And I like baseball. I like sports. You know, I, I was up at 5 o'clock in the morning watching the President's Cup in, live in Australia. You know, or no, that was recorded. I, no, no, I didn't have to watch it. I had to watch it recorded that day. But I, I, I was finished. I mean, I'm, I like sports. I like competition. But when it's all over with, and the adrenaline is all done, and the game is over, you know, the next day, it's not affecting my life. Not at all. It was an enjoyment moment. 
And in the world of changing lives, we have preachers all over the world. All over the world. We host a seminar called Thriving Under 300. It's, it's going to be in February. It's only a couple months away. We invite pastors who have churches smaller than 300. And we treat them to a seminar, an all-day seminar. And we talk to them and share with them how they um, can be effective at their size. And we uh, give them lunch. We give them material. We provide for them. We don't charge them anything for it. We host it right here. And we have anywhere from 50, 60, 5, 70 different pastors coming and different churches coming. And if each church uh, has 100 people, you know, you're talking about 5,000 people you're talking to by talking to the leader. But what we're doing is we're, we're helping them to get strong and to be strong in the Lord and to, to do ministry together and develop relationships and answer questions and give hope. There are two things that's always on that, the mind of the pastor that has a congregation under 300 people. Two things, always on their mind. It's always there, just there. How do I get more people and how do I get more money? Those two things. It's always there. I need more people and I need more money. And then be, the very fact if it was ever said out loud, other people will say, well, you're just in it for the money. No, he's in it because he or she is in it because there's something that burns in their heart. There's a passion that burns in their heart. And what burns in their heart is to change people's lives and they believe they have a message that's going to change more than the small group that they have at that moment. And they believe that the message they have costs more than the money that they have right now and they want to give. And did you know less than 20% of church attenders in the United States of America tithe? If you could imagine that if all the people tithe regularly, they'd be able to preach the gospel to more people and be able to reach people quicker, faster, effectively. Paul says, pay them. That's what he says. He says, pay them. And then he goes into verse 7. And in verse 7, here's what he says. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now, here's what I'd like you to see about these two things. He says, God's not mocked. You're going to reap what you sow. But I want you to understand something that Paul brings out in this second verse. And that is verse number 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows of the Spirit will of his Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. The place that your seed is sown is the place that your seed will grow, and the place that your seed will grow will result in what you reap. And let me give it in a different way. <clears throat> you know what? I've got a, uh, I'm going to put my screen up here that I didn't have uh, planned, but it's from last week. If you remember, this is the components of the person, of you. All the way on the right is the flesh. Then you have the mind, the soul, the heart, and the spirit. And if you are going to be reaping of the flesh, he says, if you sow in the flesh, that is, let me see if I can get my pen turned on real quick. That is this right here. If you sow in your flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. Which simply means, if you go after the desires of your flesh, if you go after what your flesh wants over the things of God, then your flesh will give you fruit. And the fruit of the flesh will be more flesh, which means that you'll be more addicted to what you desire, and it will control your life more, and you become a slave to it. But he says, but if you sow to the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. That if I, have, if I am living life from within my spirit, if I am living life from the things of the unction of the Holy Spirit and what God is saying to me, if I'm living life by the unction of God and the, the move of the Spirit and the voice of God and the Word of God and my convictions, my own faith, my own conviction of my own heart that I believed in God, then I will reap more of the Spirit. And the Spirit will produce the fruit or the flesh will produce the fruit. 
So how do you want your fruit? Where's the fruit going to come from? And he said that there is a law in the, in, that's put into the kingdom of God. And the law of the kingdom of God is that the law is you will reap what you sow. So are you sowing from the spirit or sowing from the flesh? In other words, if you say of the flesh, I'm just going to, I don't care. I'm, gonna, I'm going back to the guy caught in, trans, in, in a trespass. And the guy in the trespass says, forget it. I'm going to keep on doing this. I don't care what God says. He's going to reap more and more, and the results will be the flesh will wear out, and it'll be problems with your health, problems with your bones, problems with your body. The book of Proverbs is full of it. it tells you what can happen to you if you go after the flesh, or you're going to go after the spirit. And then he says this in verse 8 again. For he who sows of the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows of the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So Paul in one of his bullet points says, keep on going. Keep on going. We sang a song this morning that says, you know, even though I don't see it, you're, work, you're still working. Even though I don't feel it, you're still working. And that's what Paul is saying right here. Even though you don't see it, even you don't feel it, God is still working and don't lose heart. Don't, and it says, he says again, let us not grow weary while doing good. Those pastors that I tell you, that I talk to you about, the pastors of churches of under 300 that we host, you know, in February, they're weary, they're worn out. And what they're worn out is, they're worn out in doing good because they don't think they see enough results and by not seeing the results, they think that either God has passed them over or God isn't caring about what they're doing or they're totally missing God. But what they're doing is following this passion that's deep inside them, that's the that unction of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is moving inside them to continue to go forward and just like you do. The person that comes and gets involved in church and greets people at the front door, don't, it says here, don't go, grow weary in doing good. And that keep on smiling, keep on welcoming people, keep on bringing them into the presence of God, keep on making it ready for them. And he says, you will reap. Amen. I deserve more than one amen. Yeah. Verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So he says, let's do something good. When is the last time you did something good for a complete stranger? Could have been this morning. You know, you could open the door for your spouse. You look at me, what, that complete stranger? Some of you are strangers. <laughs> I mean, you could get to know each other a little better. <laughs> Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good, especially to those who are the household of faith. Did you know helping out in the nursery and changing diapers so that a mom can be in church with confidence that my baby is taken care of and hear the word of God is an act of goodness. Helping out in children's ministry talking to kids. Let me, let me ask this question. Were, how many of you were, as a child, raised in church? Okay, oh, only about half. As a child, you were raised in church. How many of you had like, uh, you went to a Sunday school class, or you went to a children's class, and not just the adult, you did. Do any of you remember any of your teachers? Anyone? Put your hand up if you remember some teachers. And they, it, 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 some of the things they said affected your life in a positive way. You know, I can say the same thing. There were volunteer adults teaching children who positively affected my life. And that's what you're doing when you're not in this room and you're helping in children's ministry. You are affecting somebody's forever because you're ministering to them and you're helping them out. Then in verse 11, 12, 13, he talks about people utilizing you as a trophy. He said that they don't want to follow the law, but they make you follow the law, and then they brag about all the disciples they have. And then he goes to verse 13, and he says this. 
For what even, um, for not even those who are circumcised kept the law, but they desire for to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. And Paul says this, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Wow. Paul says I'm disconnected from the world. My identity doesn't come from the world. It comes from the kingdom of God. My citizenship doesn't come from the world. It comes from the kingdom of God. Paul is saying that I've been crucified to the world and the world to me. He goes, and that's all that matters. There, are, there is no other trophy except the crucifixion. And then he says in verse, seven, verse 15, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Did you know that in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, Paul prayed for you. Paul said his prayer was that if you will take the same mental attitude that my identity is in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then mercy and peace would be upon me. That's my, my name's in the Bible. Paul prayed for me right there. Right there. That's Paul praying for me. Because I believe that that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith in Christ Jesus. And that my faith in Christ Jesus and his resurrection is what gives me identity and that I have the right to have mercy and peace in my life. So in a time of turmoil, it's time to have peace. Why? Because Paul, over 2,000 years ago, prayed for me, and I know God heard Paul's prayers. <laughs> right? And all good Catholics know that. Is that right? So here's how Paul wraps it up. In chapter 6, he wraps it up this way. When you see a Christian sin or being in a season of sin, reach out and try to restore them. When you think you're haughty and big wig and you're not even carrying your own load, examine yourself and start carrying your load. Make sure your preachers are paid and make sure that you understand if you sow in the Spirit, you're going to reap from the Spirit. So all the spiritual sowing that you're doing by receiving the Word of God and thinking about the Word of God in your prayer time is going to reap results. And if you want to walk in mercy and peace, make sure you do it because your identification comes from Christ and not what you have done, but what He has done. And he wraps up the book. And we close our books. We close our Bibles. We turn off our devices. And we say thank you, Paul, for the letter to the Galatians. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Can I tell you what's going to happen in January? I am so excited about the series God has put in my heart that I get to share in the month of January. As I see it, the beginning of the year and the beginning of a decade. And I, I've, I don't know the beta title do you know what I mean by that? I have a beta title. It, it, it could be, it could be, it could change, it could tweak, it could go through um, different kinds of morphine kind of stuff. But right now I'm calling it seeing God like you've never seen him before. And I want to talk to you about the difference of your confusion, God's not confused, of the Old Testament Father and the New Testament Father. I'm going to share why did God judge Israel and I'm going to share why God doesn't judge you. Why he has already judged you on the cross. And I'm going to, I want to open your eyes for you to see God the Father like you've never seen him before. And then I want to have your eyes while they're open, see you. And when you see you, you're going to be able to walk into the greatest level of faith that you have personally ever had. So you give me four Sundays in January and I will pump you up for the whole year. <laughs> Amen. 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 Did you learn something today? Can we thank the Lord?